ready to keep you company wherever you are. Card Blanche, the podcast, brings you immersive, hard-hitting stories anytime, anywhere, every week. This is another jam-packed episode of the Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche, where we take a look at some of the biggest headlines from this past week. Here's what's coming your way today. Russia gives Daily Maverick the cold shoulder just days before the Russia-Africa summit. We ask why. Going, going, a goer. Is there still time to save this multi-billion rand pact? The pressure mounts as Paul Mashatile's VIP unit appears in court. And it's all eyes on women's sports as the Netball World Cup and FIFA Women's World Cup is in full swing. Let's get into it. Welcome to another episode of the Whole Week Wrap with Daily Maverick and Carte Blanche. As always, I'm your host, Lazan Janssen von Rensburg, and joining us today is Daily Maverick Managing Editor, Janet Hurd. Hi, Janet. How are you this week? Hi, Lazan. I'm good, thank you. And you? I'm great, thanks. I'm just uh, trying to keep up with all the latest news developments. I mean, it's been quite a week. Absolutely. I mean, we sort of so much on the global stage now as well. It's not just looking nationally. We've got to keep mm. up. Uh, so much on what's happening internationally at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that gets us straight into our first story. And, and it, it was quite a, a shocking one for me. It was recently revealed that Daily Maverick foreign policy specialist Peter Fabricius, I mean, we've had him on the show as well. His accreditation to attend this past week's Russia-Africa summit was suddenly revoked with no reason, apparently. But I understand you have some more insights into what actually could have happened there. Well, I've been working with Peter over the past few weeks as he's go to really in within Maverick and you know everything was set up after the debacle with the journalists being left on the tarmac in Poland and Warsaw with the previous visit where people were going to Russia you know we, we were a little bit circumspect about trying to fork out and arrange another trip to Russia <laughs> and then we thought no no we must go ahead because this Africa Russia um, summit is really important Peter Fabricius had been at the inaugural summit in Sochi in 2019. So we went ahead with the accreditation and he was back to go and got accreditation at least a week or 10 days before uh, confirmed in writing. And then, only then, did we get going with the bookings to establish it all because we thought, okay, he's been accredited. And it was a real blow. I mean, there were lots of logistics to organize this as, you know, it's not easy to make these arrangements and travel to Russia's not easy in in itself and everything was sorted out finally of the weekend organized accommodation and then he was meant to leave on Tuesday on Monday morning at about 10.08 he got an email saying that he was no longer accredited and there was just no reason at all nothing supplied at all so of course it set this whole motion of trying to see how to rectify it I did try and send an email to the organizers asking why and can they reverse it and, and, and reinstate Peter and didn't even hear back from them they they communicated vaguely with Peter that there's no chance that this decision will be reversed so that he could mm-hmm. attend. So yeah, it, it was just incredibly puzzling. I mean, I don't think other, we would have tried to find out if other journalists have been denied access. It, I haven't heard anybody. So it does seem like a, perhaps a targeted campaign against Daily Maverick in particular, which is a very outspoken principal publication. And we find it very, very annoying, really, that there hasn't even been an attempt to give us a reason. We can only then surmise what the reasons are, obviously, and that's obviously what's been happening. It's just a really bad sign for trying to when somebody like Peter Fabricius is a very well-known veteran foreign policy journalist, very, very balanced, very calm, very one of the most, you know, sort of clear writers who t- tries to give all sides of the story, never had complaints in that regard. And having covered the 2019 summit as well, it, it really just was a slap in the face and just is a sign of the, you know, of Russia. You know, we know the, the authoritarian, the controlled media there, and it's a very worrying situation that we couldn't even send our own correspondents 
correspondent to go and actually report on what is meant to be a very important event even to Russia. It's an important summit, but the summit hasn't actually, you know, it seems to have deteriorated. It's only had half the African leaders there this, mm. this time compared to the inaugural one. As important as the summit is, it does seem to be a bit of a flop this year because, as you've just said, only half of, of the invited African leaders actually attended. And, I mean, it, it just kind of shows how isolated the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, actually is, considering he had hoped that this summit would show the West kind of, you know, that the Russian uh, government still carries favor with the African continent. I think it is indicative of, you know, there's so much going on on that front in, in the war. It's coming after the, the Wagner mutiny and then retreat to Belarus. So Putin's got a lot on his plate. This meeting comes on the back of his Russia pulling out of the Black Seaport uh, grain mm. deal, which has really impacted Africa. And that's why African countries are really concerned about the impact this will have on their ability to get grain. Putin had really had, in his opening remarks, has actually said that he you know, he will supply the grain and he, he's got ways to supply the grain to Africa. There's so much at stake for Africa in this war and we are being treated, I mean, as a, as a, as a continent, I don't think we've been treated with the sort of dignity and the respect that we deserve. You know, we are a little bit of a political football to these major states and it's very hard to find ways to fight it. As the make or break a Goa forum inches closer, the crucial pact between South Africa and the United States is becoming increasingly uncertain. With the African Growth and Opportunity Act set for renewal in 2024, both US Congress and SA Treasury are preparing for the worst. So, could South Africa be booted from this lucrative trade agreement due to its problematic relationship with Russia? Also, another big one that's on everyone's radar is AGOA. In short, powerful U.S. Senator Jim Reich recently made it very clear that our AGOA eligibility is on the line. I mean, Jim Reich in Congress, they're pushing for amendments that could firstly move the AGOA forum entirely to a different country, but also to relook our relationship with Russia because they have concerns. And it also seems as though our national treasury is preparing for the worst. So do you think it's a done deal for South Africa in terms of our eligibility for GOA? Are we set to lose some or all the GOA benefits come the renewal period next year? I think it sounds like it's too late anyway, even if what the Senator is trying to do is actually move the, the summit that is due later this year, mm. uh, which is meant to be held in South Africa. He's trying to have it moved, shift a little away from South Africa to another country because of Pretoria's perceived closeness to Russia. But it sounds like it's, a, you know, it's too late for that to happen anyway for this period. So hopefully the AGO forum will still happen, regardless of what pressure there is being applied by Republicans in, in the US and other, other pressure. South Africa seems to be lobbying and really doing its bit to try and actually remain part of, of AGO. They are trying to do damage control as best they can. They're also getting a lot of pressure from, you know, from the US to, to, to ramp up criticism of Russia and actually, you know, never mind being non-aligned, taking a stand against Russia. There's a lot of pressure on South Africa, right? Now, we haven't been sending the right signals in, in many respects over the mm. past month. I'm a bit annoyed um, because we've all been saying, listen, it's coming. You're going to find yourself in a very sticky situation. And they just didn't listen. You you can't host the Russian military in SA waters. And you can't have all of these various meetings with the Russian state. So they are essentially gambling with our economy. Absolutely, Lizan. And I think there's also just a narrative that is unfortunate. Fortunate, and it was really well pointed out by Monty Makanya, the editor of City Press. So he was with a, a group of African editors and they had an interaction with Zelensky, where Zelensky actually pointed out and something that's really bugged me over the coverage of, of this war in Ukraine. The, the point that, you know, South Africa's ties with USSR, that keeps being used as a reason why we have these support for Russia or this, this legacy interest in Russia, whereas in fact the USSR consisted of the Ukraine as well. Mm. And it's just such a weird thing for me that it's been so blinded and so poorly represented the ANC, you know, that's the push from the ANC that we, you know, we had this big bond to Russia. But in fact, the role that, that Ukraine was part of the USSR as well. And a lot of work was done for the struggle in Ukraine itself. So many things don't add up, but there's this, this narrative that gets put out and it's not questioned. We, we really do need to look at the reasons that the ANC have given and obviously putting pressure on Ramaphosa to take the soft side with Russia. It's, it's often not actually completely correct. 
It took a while, but the eight VIP protection unit officers implicated in a brutal assault caught on camera finally made their first appearance in court. And while the focus falls on the so-called blue light mafia, we look at whether this could be yet another damaging blow to Deputy President Paul Mashatile's political aspirations. So taking us to more local news, last week eight SAPS members who formed part of Deputy President Paul Mashatile's VIP Protection Unit finally appeared in court for bail proceedings. But I want to talk about how their arrest and the subsequent court appearances came to be because, I mean, they were only arrested and charged weeks after the incident. Was this a case of pressure from the media and the public just forcing authorities' hand? What happened? This, um, this, is, yeah, this has been a really fascinating and, and, and obviously quite a troubling case. It was more than three weeks ago now when everyone, I think the whole country would have watched that video mm. and there was just such outrage about it and Paul Mashatile's office did eventually release a statement saying that these members were part of these VIP unit. Then there was a whole lot of conversations about where Paul Mashatile was in the convoy. They said he wasn't in the car um, and then you know, eventually they handed themselves over on the Sunday night and they appeared in court on the Monday and they processed um, has played out all of last week and will continue this week with the continuation of the bail application. I think we could look at it this way, that if there wasn't the video of that event and if there wasn't the public outrage, I don't think we would have got to this point where we have. And I think that's also a really a positive thing that, in fact, there's nowhere to hide. And because it was so much in the public glare and it just struck a nerve, it really did. People were just so angry when they saw this video. It has been a slow process, but we have got to this point now where eight accused are in facing quite very serious charges. One of the accused says they were protecting the second most important citizen, which is Mashatile, mm. led to a bit of a back and forth with Mashatile's office exactly where Paul Mashatile was. And I think that's still unresolved. I think they're still beating around the bush there. I think he needs to come out and say exactly which car he was in because he was clearly part of the convoy, maybe not in that car that's seen visibly, but he, it was his con- convoy. So, yeah, yeah, it just seemed like beating around the bush. Even if Paul Mashatile was in, which, which you know is part of the convoy in some way, it does speak to the attitude of protection of, of powerful people. So I don't think it wasn't just that that story that struck a nerve in South Africa wasn't just about Paul Mashatile. It was just people being fed up with feeling bullied and pushed around by the powerful in all yeah. sorts of areas of South Africa's life. It, it was a symbol, really, kind of a, a visual symbol for so much that South Africans are, are tired of. Paul Mashatele still needs to come completely clean. The, the office is saying, yes, he was kind of there, but he wasn't there. Just tell us. Then we move on. He criticised the actions of the blue light bullies, as you call them. But now we need to see about what, what is the culture of protection in this country, if officers feel that they can get away with this type of behaviour. Yes. But Lizanne, just one other thing to point out is that it is true, and that's what's come out in court in the last week, that we don't know what led to the assault. I mean, we don't know, we don't have a video of, you know, the bull that. So now there's all sorts of allegations of what state of mind the victims were in, etc. I mean, there is all, this is always the case, but the, the thing is, no matter what happened in the build-up, which we couldn't see on the video, wasn't shown to us, it doesn't excuse that type of behaviour because mm-hmm. there are other ways of dealing with, with somebody who may have upset a convoy. And that's looking mm-hmm. at it incredibly, trying to be very kind-hearted about it because, in fact, it was just disgraceful. But, oh, yeah. but in, mm-hmm. no matter what happened in the build-up, it's not the right behaviour. Yeah, as we all know. Definitely. I chatted to your colleague, Queen in Maswabi, about two weeks ago about the various scandals surrounding Mashatile. And at the time, she emphasized that this is more an internal matter for the ANC to deal with, that the fallout for the ANC on a national level could be minimal. But I mean, it seems like these scandals just keep mounting against him. So do you think he can overcome this deluge of bad news? The, the timing is, is completely coincidental <laughs> of the bodyguard mm. like bullies, as we're calling it, case on the highway that played out at the same time as he's, as Paul Mashatile has come under incredible scrutiny, particularly by exposés that uh, News24 have done and and now, which has actually led now 
now to a court threat to by uh, Paul Machetelli's business associates to try and get News24 to not use the term Alex Mafia, which mm. which I think is a real problem in terms of media freedom. So, but sticking to Machetelli, you know, he's, he's the second most powerful person in the country, and he clearly has ambitions to be president. There's a lot obviously playing out within the ANC. It seems that the fight back campaign by Machetelli is very intense. There's a WhatsApp group called Hands Off Machetelli that has started where they're discussing social media strategy to counter, you know, the reports on Machatili's lifestyle and his associates. It's not going to stop. As we build up the elections next year as well, I think Machatili is going to be fighting for his credibility. We need to just keep digging to to get to the bottom of the, the stature and credibility that he has. I actually remember him as a young, very young rookie reporter when he was on a hunger strike as an activist, an Alex activist in, in Johannesburg. And they were actually taken to the what was in the Joburg General Hospital because they, you know, were, were so frail and mm. ill. And he was a real struggle stalwart. I mean, he comes from a strong legacy of, of struggle and commitment to correcting South Africa during apartheid. So it's such an interesting trajectory to see him now rise to such a high level at being the second in, in command. But he's got a lot to answer for. And if the ANC is going to clean up its act and stop corruption, it has to act with integrity and ensure that its leaders are beyond reproach. It's very unfortunate that we, you know, the scandal, we don't, no one wants the scandal, but the scandal can't be avoided and we need to just keep digging. Absolutely. The Spa Proteas set the tone for this year's Netball World Cup, currently being hosted in Cape Town, when they won their first match against Wales. We wrap up today's show as we celebrate the power of netball and how it's finally receiving the attention and recognition it so rightfully deserves. It's all eyes on women's sports. We're already a few games into the FIFA Women's World Cup. And the Netball World Cup also started this past Friday. And I don't know about you, but I'm loving all of this women's sports. It's taken years and years of fighting. But finally, it seems that people are paying attention to the ladies in, in the various sports arenas. So I am thrilled. Absolutely, Lizanne. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if you played netball as a kid at school. I played netball and I love the sport and it was just always seen as a second rate. It was always in the shadows of all the male sport, of, of soccer and rugby. Women's sport is really coming out of the shadows now. Um, the netball is one area that we are ranked fifth in the world. I think we all got to get behind the team now. It's, it's quite amazing that Cape Town is hosting the World Cup. There has been a great attempt to give it a bit of attention, even in the city of Cape Town has tried to create space to show and get behind the team. You know, we need to think about how fantastic it is to have this event in South Africa. I know there were a few hitches of people struggling to get tickets, but they've set up fan parks, areas around Cape Town where you can actually go and watch the games, um, even if you can't afford the tickets. Yeah, the next few weeks, I think it ends on about the 6th or the 8th of August. We've got a couple mm. of days to really get behind this team. I think kudos should also go to the sponsors. Well, I never normally yes. like mentioning the sponsors, but they really have stuck it out and supported this team to bring it to where we are at. And we are up against, you know, being fifth in the world, it's, it's going to be tough, but it's not to say we can't do it. We could mm. actually take the cup. With the home advantage that we have and some of the exceptional players that we already have on the team, we could actually surprise everyone. I'm convinced we're going to surprise the world with this. Let's hope they can take Jamaica and yes. then move on from there. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we, we have to acknowledge also the fact that this has really put the spotlight squarely on netball, you know, as a sport in South Africa and Africa and its ability to really transform lives and communities. Girls in schools will see the role model potential of, of an event like this. It's just, you, you know, you can't match it because it does start from the bottom up. And so now we've got this incredible event with these amazing athletes, amazing women athletes from around the world on our doorsteps. And it just, just gives it such a lift. Mm. So Janet, it's been wonderful chatting to you. Thanks for, as always, bringing your amazing insights. It's been an absolute joy chatting to you. Thank you very much, Nivelle. And that's a wrap. In case you missed any of our previous chats with Daily Maverick, you can find them all on Carte Blanche, the podcast, available on Spotify and all major podcasting platforms. <laughs>